Today, I'm diving into a classic, Poor Charlie's Almanac, The Wit and Wisdom of Charles T. Munger. Most of you might already be acquainted with this iconic figure, but let's take a brief moment to introduce Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger has been Warren Buffett's right-hand man for decades. While most people are familiar with Warren Buffett, the spotlight-loving investor who often shares his insights with the public, Munger prefers to keep a lower profile. Buffett once remarked, Charlie is smarter and wiser than I am. I've met countless people in my life, but none quite like him. He's just more reserved. Originally a lawyer, Munger comes from a lineage of legal professionals, with ancestors and parents serving as lawyers and judges. After graduating from Harvard Law School, he transitioned from practicing law to becoming one of the most successful investors of our time. His achievements in the investment realm have secured him a spot on Forbes' billionaire list. When asked about the secret behind Munger's success, Buffett succinctly described it with one word, rationality. And who does Munger look up to? None other than Benjamin Franklin, a key figure in the American Revolution and the inventor of the lightning rod, Franklin was not just a polymath and a great inventor, but also a prominent leader and writer. Franklin penned a series titled Poor Richard's Almanac. Under the pseudonym Poor Richard, Franklin wrote a collection of essays, many of which contained his famous sayings. Our book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, pays homage to Franklin's writings. Munger, a devout fan of Franklin, holds him in the same reverence as we do for Munger. Munger's dedication to Franklin's teachings is evident throughout this book, showcasing his wisdom in both investment and life. One of the most striking things about Munger, apart from his rationality and intellect, is his tenacity. In early 2010, Munger faced back-to-back -back tragedies. After losing his wife of 50 years, he experienced an accident which led to a 90% vision loss in his right eye. At 86, for someone who regarded reading and thinking as vital as breathing, this was a massive blow. Yet, he remained positive and rational, exploring various reading devices and even considering learning Braille. Miraculously, he regained 70% of his vision in that eye later on. Let's first discuss his mindset for business analysis and evaluation, known as the multidisciplinary approach. As I mentioned earlier, Charlie Munger's intelligence stands out in various ways. Two aspects differentiate him from others. The first is this multidisciplinary thinking, a trait he shares with Benjamin Franklin, who was known for his diverse expertise. Munger, like Franklin, excels in integrative thinking, allowing him to approach problems from various angles. The second unique trait is his contrary in thinking. While most might strategize by listing steps to success, Munger approaches it differently. He thinks in terms of what not to do or what could lead to failure. 2. Most people don't adopt multidisciplinary thinking, which, if common, would make everyone appear much smarter. For instance, if I studied economics during my undergrad, I'd naturally apply economic models to problems. This is a critique Munger often voices about our education system. It tends to compartmentalize knowledge, leaving most with only one or two disciplinary lenses to view the world. It's not unusual to see professionals, be it from law or economics, leveraging their specific expertise to analyze current events or even popular TV shows. And while it might seem impressive, it reminds me of the saying, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But real life doesn't always present nails. We've just talked about the importance of a multidisciplinary thinking model, but how can one cultivate this mindset? Charlie Munger suggests two crucial steps. First, one must acquire foundational knowledge across various disciplines akin to universal wisdom. Such foundational understanding is paramount. Secondly, one needs to familiarize oneself with different mental models. Munger once said, Becoming a person of universal wisdom is simple. All you need is mastery over 80 to 90 mental models. However, he soon added, emphasizing that only a few of these models are vital. So how does one acquire these models? Start by diving deep into foundational subjects. Essential disciplines include mathematics, where you should comfortably handle numerical problems, understand basic mathematical principles, and even concepts like permutation and combination, the foundational notions of combinatorics. Besides mathematics, a grasp of accounting is essential. Originating from the Venetians, understanding accounting helps one recognize its limitations. Lastly, a grounding in psychology is crucial since we constantly interact with people. Mastery of these three foundational areas, mathematics, accounting, and psychology, 
is non-negotiable. Models stemming from the hard sciences and engineering rank as the most dependable. Grasping engineering's quality control theories is vital, given the high stakes in engineering projects. Concepts like backup systems in engineering, breakpoint theory, related to interactions between cities and regions, and the critical mass concept in physics are powerful tools. While statistics is pivotal, Munger believes it's not mandatory for everyone to be proficient. Even if Munger can't pinpoint the intricacies of the Gaussian distribution, he's aware of its form and recognizes that many real-world events follow this distribution. Microeconomics, though not as robust as other disciplines, offers valuable thinking methods, as does psychology. The crux of Munger's advice. Never view problems in isolation, rote learning, rigid memorization, or piecing things together without seeing the broader connections won't lead to genuine understanding. One can't apply these concepts effectively in real life without a cohesive framework connecting them. After familiarizing oneself with foundational knowledge across many disciplines and mastering over 80 or 90 mental models, one truly becomes enlightened and intelligent. You know he's an exceptionally successful investor, which means he has to assess which company stocks are worth investing in and which projects merit significant effort. In this process, we'll touch upon another facet of Charlie Munger's intelligence. One aspect, as we previously discussed, is his multidisciplinary thinking capability. The other is his contrarian or reverse thinking. After reading his book, I realized that the most brilliant minds often communicate the most clearly. Both Buffett and Munger can explain stocks in layman's terms. They define stocks as, essentially, ownership of a company. This ownership is divided into numerous shares, hence stocks. So what determines stock prices, their value? And what determines this value, the value of the company? The worth of a company is tied to its profitability and its current net assets. While stock prices fluctuate and are unpredictable in the short term, in the long run, they reflect the company's value. A smart investor, in their view, should buy when stock prices are lower than the company's actual worth and sell when they approach or exceed it. Following this strategy, one can make significant profits with minimal risk. Understanding this simplifies what Buffett and Munger do. They consistently search for undervalued stocks. While it sounds straightforward, the execution is challenging. How does one identify valuable enterprises and good stocks? Unlike many investment institutions that boast about the volume of their investments, Munger isn't one to pride himself on the quantity. 1. His investment approach is clear. He meticulously defines his circle of competence. 2. Anything outside this circle he rarely considers. He categorizes all investments into three types, investable, non-investable, and too complicated. Many companies might present their operations as sophisticated, but such firms, according to Munger, cannot pass his initial screening. After narrowing down to investable options, he conducts a comprehensive evaluation, considering both quantitative and qualitative factors, including internal and external elements, industry conditions, and other seemingly intangible or hard-to-quantify aspects. After such a rigorous assessment, what remains are likely outstanding candidate companies. Is it time to buy? Not yet. Munger doesn't rush to purchase stocks. Even after accurate evaluations, he believes in buying at the right time, leading to further filtering. This secondary screening is likened to the final check before pulling a trigger. How does he check? Here's the crooks. Munger recommends an effective method called the checklist. His investment checklist poses questions about current prices, trading conditions, the existence of sensitive factors, potential exit strategies, and so on. Only after ticking off this list might he consider buying the company's stock. How did he succeed? Munger first identifies what to avoid, understanding what not to do, before contemplating the next actions. He once humorously remarked, I just want to know where I'll die, so I never go there, epitomizing his strategy of evading pitfalls. By skirting these pitfalls and focusing his energy in fruitful areas, Munger reaped significant benefits. This error avoidance was made possible through the checklist we previously discussed. Why is this checklist useful for students and professionals alike? When students review their exams, they often miss mistakes. However, by creating a checklist of common errors, they can more effectively review their work. Let's sum up Munger's investment evaluation process. He has developed his own behavior system, unique to him. Initially, he rapidly discerns what shouldn't be done and excludes at. 
Then he applies his multidisciplinary thinking to tackle the tasks at hand, only tacking decisive action when the time is right. Munger himself is a testament to the efficacy of this system, stating, I am living proof that if you apply this method, you can outperform those much smarter than you and earn a lot of money. Understanding this also clarifies why Munger has few investment opportunities. He waits for the perfect shot, unfazed by public sentiment or trends. He remains steadfast to his principles, resulting in infrequent trades. He posits, in life, only a few right decisions are needed to build a successful investment career. Hence, when Munger believes in a company, he invests heavily and holds for the long term. This approach minimizes trading costs, saves on taxes, and avoids unnecessary chatter. Munger once stated, Only a person with character can sit on cash and do nothing. My success stems from not chasing mediocre opportunities. Not pursuing mediocrity is challenging. It requires multidisciplinary thinking and the ability to resist following the crowd. Let's explore some of Charlie's advice on how to live a better life, as mentioned in his conversations and Q&As. How can one achieve happiness and success? Charlie offers a few key suggestions. Avoid actions that might lead to unhappiness. Life isn't just about accumulating wealth wisely. Most of your success in life and business comes from knowing what pitfalls to avoid. For instance, avoiding premature death, staying clear of a bad marriage, preventing HIV, steering clear of drugs, cultivating positive mental habits, and keeping away from malicious individuals. If your individuality makes you unpopular among peers, then so be it. Be content with what you have. Avoid envy at all costs. There will always be someone whose wealth grows faster than yours. So what if someone made a fortune investing in high-risk stocks? Charlie mentions that neither he nor Warren Buffett ever fret about others profiting in different industries. Yet George Soros, another investor, couldn't bear others profiting from the tech sector while he missed out, leading him to make rash decisions and suffer significant losses. Another piece of advice which I find quite insightful and can aid in achieving happiness and success is from his lecture at Harvard. Stay consistent and be wholeheartedly committed to your current endeavours. Any fickleness can negate the combined benefits of all your strengths. Consistency is crucial in avoiding regrets and pursuing happiness. On Wealth Accumulation When someone asked him, how can I be as wealthy as you? Charlie's response was clear-cut. Every day, strive to be a little wiser than the day before. Excel in your tasks, and over time, you'll see progress. This progress might be slow, but it lays the foundation for rapid advancement in the future. Inch forward every day, and ultimately, most people get what they deserve. Furthermore, he emphasizes reducing materialistic desires and avoiding debt. With the current inflation, many find their investment returns dwindling. If inflation concerns you, one of the best preventive measures is to limit extravagant desires in life. You don't need a multitude of material goods, and once you get caught in the debt cycle, it's challenging to escape. Especially avoid credit card debt. You can't expect growth when saddled with interest payments. On learning regarding learning, Charlie is famously quoted for emphasizing the importance of reading. Of all the brilliant individuals I've encountered in my lifetime, none of them neglect daily reading, not a single one. He remarked, Warren Buffett reads so much that it might surprise you, and my children often jest that I'm a walking book. He mentions that while he and Buffett have amassed considerable wealth, there's no guarantee that the next decade will be as profitable. Therefore, one must become a learning machine. Charlie reminds us to learn from the triumphs and missteps of both historical and contemporary figures. Avoid repeating past evident mistakes in business and delve into the best works of predecessors. By standing on the shoulders of giants, you'll see further than others. On work. He highlighted three fundamental principles for work. Firstly, never sell something you wouldn't buy yourself. Many folks work for companies whose products they don't believe in. Some salespeople even sell items they personally don't trust. For instance, they might sell insurance but don't believe in its value. Or they might sell houses while thinking people shouldn't buy homes. If you're always selling what you wouldn't purchase, you won't excel in your job. Secondly, don't work for someone you don't respect and admire. Working under someone you deeply dislike or don't respect is perilous. He advised, if you wish to sidestep such hazards, you must have both talent and determination. In my youth, I would identify individuals I held in high esteem 
and then find a way to work under them. Achieving success under someone you admire will grant you greater satisfaction in life. Many prioritize salary over a positive work environment, thinking money is of utmost importance. But working reluctantly in such an environment hampers your potential, and even if you achieve success, it won't bring true satisfaction. Lastly, only work with colleagues you genuinely like. This is a tough one, as many workplace grievances stem from disagreements or clashes with co-workers. Most of the time, we interact more with our colleagues than our bosses. Charlie's advice to only work with people you like is challenging but crucial. He mentioned his own life as a testament to these principles, selling what he'd buy, working for someone he respects, Warren Buffett, and working alongside people he genuinely likes. But as Charlie mentioned, even if it seems almost impossible to fulfill all three, one should still give it their best shot. Next, we delve into the realm of human psychological misjudgments. While this book is a compilation of Charlie Munger's speeches and remarks, and not written by him directly, this specific section on psychological misjudgments stands out as Charlie's own work. It's evident he holds this topic in high regard. He advised, when analyzing problems, don't rely on a single-track approach, but embrace dual-track analysis. So what is dual-track analysis? Logically speaking, first, identify the factors that truly control the vested interests. For instance, in card games, determine the genuine stakes and pinpoint the real opportunities. Then, consider human instincts, emotions and greed, which often lead to erroneous judgments. His insights don't stem from formal psychological education. Despite graduating from Caltech and Harvard, Charlie was unfamiliar with psychology. It was only post-Harvard that he began earnestly absorbing relevant psychological knowledge. Instead of adhering strictly to textbooks, he compiled examples of misjudgments from various fields and applied psychological theories to them. Eventually, he encountered a seminal book, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, by Robert Cialdini. The book has had a profound impact, and Charlie admired it so much that he sent copies to all his children. In gratitude for Cialdini's contributions, Charlie even gifted him some Class A company stocks. So what is the focus of the psychology of human misjudgment? It addresses occasional glitches in human cognition, highlighting our susceptibility to deception. Two main reasons lead to such misjudgments. First is the minor effects in human perception. If a stimulus is below a certain threshold, we don't register it. For instance, magicians succeed because their movements are so delicate or swift that they go unnoticed. Second, even if we do notice, we might misjudge the stimulus. Our brain isn't a precise instrument. It primarily registers stark contrasts. To illustrate, a magician might distract you with a flourish and the next thing you know, your watch is missing. In reality, when the magician was removing your watch, they might have contacted your wrist. You might have felt it, but they probably simultaneously touched another part of your body with greater force, neutralizing the sensation on your wrist. Hence, you didn't feel them unfasten your watch. In this section, Charlie Munger briefly lists psychological tendencies that often mislead people, an essential part of his four checklists. He will discuss in detail the errors each tendency can lead to and offer advice on how to prevent them. I've chosen a few classic tendencies to discuss, starting with the super response to rewards and punishments. Charlie Munger often cites the case of FedEx. He describes how FedEx workers need to quickly transfer packages onto airplanes, and any delay in the process would disrupt timely deliveries. For a while, the company faced issues with night shift workers not completing tasks on time. Despite various efforts to motivate them, nothing seemed to work. However, someone had an epiphany. Rather than paying workers hourly, why not pay them per shift? If they finished their tasks early, they could head home. This approach worked wonders. Clearly, the power of a well-designed incentive system can significantly influence behavior. In today's era, knowing how to motivate others is a game-changing skill. As Benjamin Franklin mentioned in Poor Richard's Almanac, if you wish to persuade, appeal to interest rather than reason. Charlie had a friend, a brilliant legal advisor who eventually lost his job. Why? Whenever he communicated with clients, he would emphasize their moral duty. While he was technically right, he failed to underscore the benefits clients would gain by following his advice, leading to his dismissal. However, perverse incentives can lead to biases, yielding adverse outcomes. They can make individuals feel justified in their wrongdoings, 
with a strong inclination to find sound reasons for their bad behaviour. For instance, in the corporate world, employees often face a dilemma. As Charlie mentions, salespeople working solely on commission might be more inclined to act unethically, lured by the potential rewards. Yet, typically, who performs better, those with a base salary or those without? In reality, commission-only salespeople tend to excel. Hence, companies often grapple with designing the right incentive policies. I'm aware of a real estate agency where all the agents work solely on commission. Their drive is commendable, but they might resort to deceitful tactics to secure their bonuses. Another adverse outcome of incentives is that individuals tend to exploit loopholes in systems. Charlie warns that when designing such systems, one must prevent such exploitations and adhere to the principle of avoiding rewards for easily falsifiable tasks. That's the essence of the super response to rewards and punishments. The second psychological tendency is the avoidance of inconsistency. What does this mean? To conserve mental energy, people resist change. They might possess many good habits, but they also harbor bad ones they're reluctant to change. They have a strong inclination to hold on to their past learnings, previous conclusions, and former identities. I'm sure many of us have encountered stubborn individuals. Despite being evidently wrong or holding outdated views, they cling to their beliefs. This could be because of beliefs formed during their childhood, and they might hold on to them until their last breath. Charlie Munger advises us to be wary of this tendency, as it can lead to grave consequences. Whether it's clinging to outdated beliefs or letting our initial conclusions overly influence our decisions, it can steer us in the wrong direction. He mentions that in the court system, there are measures in place to counteract this. For instance, before a judge makes a decision, they are procedurally obligated to listen to extensive arguments from the defence. This helps prevent the judge and jury from succumbing to the pitfalls of initial judgment bias. Charlie provides another intriguing example. He mentions that when individuals attain a new identity, especially after making significant sacrifices, their loyalty to that identity intensifies. Consider a doctor who initially resisted the idea of the profession, finding it exhausting. Upon graduating and joining a hospital, he might complain about his job. However, if suddenly faced with a crisis, like the SARS epidemic, and he's sent to the front line, his perspective might change due to the significant sacrifices made during this period. Why? It's the result of the avoidance of inconsistency tendency. If his actions, significant sacrifice, don't align with his thoughts, resenting the doctor profession, he'd feel discomfort. To alleviate this, he would adjust his mindset to make it consistent with his actions. Thus, many societies have invented solemn initiation ceremonies, often held publicly, to enhance the loyalty of new members. Other Psychological Tendencies First up is the overconfidence bias. Do you agree that most people tend to overestimate their abilities? If not, consider this. If you ask all the drivers around you how many believe their driving skills are above average, you'd find that 90% think they're better than the mean. However, this can't be true. Statistically, only half can be above average. Numerous psychological experiments have shown that most people rate themselves and their possessions, including their children, more highly than warranted. This inflated valuation of personal items is known in psychology as the endowment effect. It reflects our tendency to believe that the decisions we make are the right ones. Many mothers, for instance, believe that having their child was the best decision they ever made. This overestimation can also lead individuals to gravitate towards and approve of others who are like them. A fun experiment called the lost wallet demonstrated that if someone finds a wallet and, based on its contents, deduces that the owner is similar to them, they're more likely to return it. Overconfidence can result in errors. Take gambling as an example. If you're assigned a random lottery number, you might place a modest bet, but if you choose the number yourself, you're likely to bet more, even though the odds remain the same. Similarly, people tend to overvalue the quality of the services they provide to a company, overestimating their importance within the organization. Such overvaluation can lead to dissatisfaction and a sense of inequity regarding compensation. Many employers during interviews place too much trust in their immediate impressions, making hiring decisions based on gut feelings from the interview. However, this can be misguided. Charlie suggests that instead of relying on interviews, employers should hire based on the tangible achievements and academic reports presented by applicants, 
which are less prone to fabrication. Many oppose this approach, feeling it's too impersonal. Still, Charlie believes interview impressions are unreliable and can lead to hiring someone who's merely a smooth talker. In essence, overconfidence bias is pervasive, and the best way to counteract it is to remind ourselves to be rational and exercise restraint. The intense reaction to deprivation. What does this mean? When we gain $10, the joy we experience is not equivalent to the pine of losing $10. In fact, the pain of loss is often far greater than the pleasure of gain. Furthermore, if someone is about to obtain something they've long desired, and it's snatched away at the last moment, they'll react as if they've owned it for a long time and it's been taken from them. Charlie termed this human reaction to such losses as the intense reaction to deprivation. This tendency means we often overreact to minor losses, sweating the small stuff when it's truly inconsequential. Take a person worth $10 million who becomes extremely upset over losing $300 from their wallet. It's irrational. Charlie recounts his own experience from decades ago when he was influenced by this bias. A stockbroker offered him shares at a ridiculously low price, which he bought. The next day, more shares were on offer, but Charlie declined because it would mean selling something else to raise the necessary cash. This aversion to loss, even when it would lead to greater gain, is a powerful human trait. In Charlie's case, the company's stock price later surged when it was acquired. He regretted not buying more, realizing that with more knowledge of psychology, he might have acted differently. Here's a tip. When you lose something, avoid an exaggerated reaction. Recognize that you might be under the sway of the intense reaction to deprivation, and that, in the grand scheme of things, that loss might not be that significant. Next, we have the social proof tendency. This one's straightforward. People instinctively think and act based on the behavior and beliefs of those around them. This simplifies complex decision-making processes. For instance, when leaving a movie theater, many don't check the route home but simply follow the crowd. This automatic alignment with the actions of others is a manifestation of the social proof tendency. It's particularly strong when people are confused or under pressure. Some salespeople exploit this by placing customers in high-pressure environments, enhancing the effects of social conformity. If everyone else in a small group is buying something, the pressure to conform can be overwhelming. Many erroneous decisions stem from this bias. In a company, always explain the rationale behind directives. Just giving orders without reasons might get the job done but explaining the why often leads to better execution. This taps into the reason-respecting tendency. Even a nonsensical or incorrect reason can persuade others more easily. An experiment demonstrated this by having people cut in line at a photocopy machine. Those who provided even a trivial reason, I need to make some copies, had a higher success rate than those who didn't. This book concludes here, highlighting three essential takeaways. Firstly, Charlie strictly operates within his circle of competence. If he doesn't understand something, he doesn't engage with it. This applies especially to his investments. He doesn't invest in businesses or buy stocks he doesn't comprehend. Secondly, the concept of multidisciplinary thinking stands out. It's not easy to grasp, but here's the approach. Emphasize learning across multiple disciplines, especially foundational knowledge. Charlie points out the significance of basics in psychology, mathematics and engineering, among others. Actively collate different ways of thinking. Once you've accumulated 80 or 90 such perspectives, you'll embody universal wisdom. The third takeaway is the importance of Charlie's contrarian thinking. How does one achieve a successful and happy life? By actively avoiding actions that lead to failure and unhappiness. Charlie shared four lists with us one of which is the checklist of common psychological misjudgments. For more on these lists, consider getting the original book. In summary, Charlie's system revolves around doing only what he understands, scrutinizing decisions through a multidisciplinary lens, and employing contrarian thinking to eliminate errors. As a result, he does few things, but with precision. This philosophy mirrors his and Buffett's investment strategy, which doesn't involve frequent trading, but focuses on seizing pivotal opportunities. As Charlie puts it, mediocre opportunities won't make a person great. I hope this book proves beneficial to you.